The SCP Foundation has a reputation for cold, inhumane conditions. But being contained as an anomalous human doesn't mean your stay inside a secure facility has to be as bad as it might seem at first. Of course, more dangerous anomalous entities, such as SCP-076, codenamed Abel, are locked away in a containment chamber outfitted with maximum security precautions and guarded by the Foundation's most well-trained and heavily armed personnel. But not every anomaly poses a danger, and the Foundation realizes that. Sure, the monsters like SCP-106 or SCP-096, who need no introduction, aren't exactly treated to a bed and breakfast every morning, but those lower on the danger scale can get pretty comfortable inside their new home, depending on how well they're behaved and how little of a threat they pose, of course. Take for instance SCP-076's less violent brother, SCP-073, also known as Kane. SCP-073 is peaceful, a complete contrast to SCP-076's destructive fits of violent and rage, and as a result, he's treated like nearly any other low-threat anomalous humanoid. Amenities, clothes, maybe even some time in the Foundation's recreational spaces if they're extra well-behaved. It's true that the Foundation has been doing a lot for the anomalies it contains, especially in recent years. After all, anomalies contained by the Foundation are, containment breaches aside, supposed to be contained for life. The least the Foundation can do with all of their seemingly infinite money and funding is show them an easier time while they're in there. Sometimes anomalous humanoids are integrated into the Foundation's command structure, such as the case with the mysterious Dr. Clef a former Global Occult Coalition agent turned Foundation operative, with reality-bending powers and a penchant for neutralizing dangerous anomalies. Or Dr. Jack Bright, who continued to work as a Foundation researcher following an accident with SCP-963, an amulet that made his consciousness immortal. Or Kane Pathos Crow, once an ordinary Foundation scientist, now a golden retriever blessed with superintelligence, thanks to an experiment gone wrong. Or Wright, depending on who you ask. It is true, the Foundation is definitely more accepting of the anomalous than it may initially seem. Let's take a look at a particularly notable anomaly contained by the Foundation. SCP-166 can be seen as a baseline example of how the Foundation treats the average humanoid anomaly that doesn't pose a significant threat to the organization or society at large. SCP-166 is contained at the famous Site-19, inside a hermetically sealed antechamber outfitted with an industrial air purifier. Personnel assigned to SCP-166's containment chamber must wear specially designated biohazard suits before entering, and keep them on at all times, lest they succumb to SCP-166's anomalous effects. SCP-166 is a teenage girl of European descent, possessing certain bodily features found on a reindeer. She has antlers, hooved feet, and a short tail. All that's missing is a red nose, right? But despite looking like one of Santa's most trusted four-legged helpers, SCP-166 has little to do with the animal. In fact, scans of her DNA reveal no irregular genetic traits. To the instruments used to record such things, she is a completely ordinary human. Her reindeer features are, according to some Foundation theorists, a reflection of her connection with nature and a remnant of her past. But we'll get to that. Aside from her fluffy parts, what makes SCP-166 so anomalous? As it turns out, SCP-166 possesses an incredibly strong anomalous ability. Any artificial objects, meaning those that are man-made, within a 15-meter radius of SCP-166 will return to an unworked state. For example, a car placed within SCP-166's range will return to a composite of paint, metals, leather, and plastics over time. These higher complexity objects, such as vehicles or electronics, are affected more quickly by SCP-166, with degradation of their metallic components giving out and causing massive structural failure, resulting in an unusable object. More natural objects made of rudimentary materials, such as stone buildings and products made of organic materials, will decay at a much slower, nearly imperceptible rate. So SCP-166 containment chamber and containment solution is more than safe, though it might need to be repaired and touched up over the years. SCP-166 is very in touch with nature as her appearance would suggest. In fact, in areas where objects degraded as a result of her influence, flowers and plant growth will begin to appear. 
Sometimes this foliage will grow in places that should otherwise be impossible for it to, such as ID scanners or security cameras. You could imagine that the inside of the chamber is practically a botanical garden. Still, the Foundation has to be careful with how SCP-166's containment chamber is constructed and who enters it, as the degrading Deer Girl harbors a particular sensitivity to artificial materials and pollutants, such as smoke or pesticides. Inhalation of or contact with one of these airy substances causes SCP-166 to grow ulcers and suffer symptoms of asthma attacks. Even being in close proximity with a smoker can cause SCP-166 pain, with one instance prompting a severe asthma attack despite the Foundation doctor in question having not smoked a cigarette in over three weeks. If you need another reason to stay away from smoking, do it for SCP-166. Isn't she adorable? You wouldn't want to give her a panic attack, would you? Not only are SCP-166's visitors limited and screened beforehand, but her clothing consists of organic cloth so as not to trigger a degradation effect. All of her meals must be prepared by a trained Foundation chef and followed according to a specific set of guidelines, with as little inorganic additives as possible. The Foundation has to be a bit more careful than usual with the items requested by SCP-166. Not only due to her anomalous ability to degrade objects, but due to her mysterious past and connection with a small convent of nuns in Ireland. We'll explain. You see, like most humanoid anomalies, the Foundation has allowed SCP-166 to put in requests for personal items she might find missing from her containment. Now, the Foundation may deny these items for a variety of reasons, but there's also a chance they won't. To date, SCP-166 has requested a copy of the Holy Bible, a Catholic Rosary, and various books and magazines involving religious content, all of which were approved by Site-19's director, Sophia Light. SCP-166 also requested access to a Catholic priest for confession, mass, and other sacraments. This request was initially denied, but later reapproved after Chaplain Davis, an ordained member of the clergy working with the Foundation, agreed to meet with SCP-166 on a bi-weekly schedule, every other Sunday. SCP-166 also requested a telephone, which she intended to use to contact the Abbess of Our Lady of Mercy Convent, a cloistered society of nuns in County Galway, Ireland. This request was a little more complicated to process. At first, it was denied, then granted, and then denied again after a reconsideration by Director Light. But why did SCP-166 want this item? What connection could the dear girl have to a group of nuns in Ireland? The answers lie in the Foundation's discovery of SCP-166. SCP-166 was discovered in the Our Lady of Mercy convent in County Galway, Ireland where the girl had been living since infancy. Her strange appearance and abilities initially made her the subject of scrutiny by the sisters who lived there, but she was taken care of and raised as a member of the Catholic faith. When the Foundation was alerted to SCP-166's existence, a defecting global occult coalition agent operating under the codename Ukulele, who is now in the process of joining the Foundation, confirmed that he recognized SCP-166. He knew that SCP-166 was the child of an incredibly dangerous entity, classified by the Global Occult Coalition as Threat Entity 9927 Black, a being codenamed the Goddess. The Goddess also was being pursued by the SCP Foundation and given a designation as an SCP object, though its number and the exact details of the file have been redacted by the Foundation for security purposes. What we do know is that the Goddess was a seriously dangerous entity and both parties were dedicating as many resources as possible to its capture, containment, or neutralization. The conflict between the Goddess, the Global Occult Coalition, and the SCP Foundation came to a head during an event known as the Cornwall Incident. The Goddess's file, which was received and archived by the SCP Foundation, has a portion describing SCP-166, which reads as follows. Threat Entity is the child of incarnated LTE-9927 Black, the goddess, and an unknown father. While it strongly resembles its mother and shares its animalistic features, it lacks the extreme bestial appearance of 9927 Black, possesses minor chlorokinetic abilities, but primary reason for threat entity classification is the instinctive knowledge and eligibility to enact occult procedure Clockwork Black Child Havala, 
a worldwide ritual working that would irreversibly regress human civilization to Neolithic standards. Strike Team Lancelot neutralized 9927 Black in England during an operation which would later be known as the infamous Cornwall Incident, but were unable to confirm the liquidation of 9927 Blackchild due to the death of the strike leader, Agent Ukulele. Ukulele was posthumously awarded the Silver Aegis for his lifelong service to humanity. As the file stated, SCP-166 is the child of the goddess, and the reason for her anomalous degradation abilities is so that she can enact them on the world and fulfill her mother's unholy mission, a ritual that would regress society to prehistoric times, ridding the world of modern technology and man-made creations. Why the goddess wanted to carry out this ritual is unknown, but SCP-166 was her key to achieving her primitive desires. Through her child, she could reach her goals, but the Cornwall incident threw a wrench in the goddess's plans. Agent Ukulele, a global occult agent famous for decommissioning dangerous anomalies, was tasked with killing SCP-166. Perhaps it was her human appearance, or the fact that she was only a small child, or even something that lay even deeper. Ukulele could not bring himself to terminate SCP-166. He defected from the Global Occult Coalition, faking his death and taking SCP-166 alongside him. Entrusting her care to the Convent of Nuns, Ukulele made himself scarce, relieved that SCP-166 was safe. After being free from the Global Occult Coalition's grasp, Ukulele was unsure of what to do with his life. Taking the name Alto Clef, Ukulele had rid his previous identity from the anomalous world and was prepared to start a new life. But he couldn't let SCP-166 live unattended. What if the Global Cult Coalition found her and terminated her in an act that would finish what they had started all those years ago? What if the Foundation discovered her? He didn't want to risk the girl being put into a life of containment that she never wanted. Clef decided that he made the best decision and kept SCP-166's existence to himself as best he could. But his hand was forced not long after. SCP-166 at the age of 12 was seen by a civilian visiting the convent, who reported her existence to the authorities. The Foundation became aware of SCP-166. Clef, wanting the best for SCP-166, exchanged valuable Global Occult Coalition intelligence, documents, and information with the Foundation in exchange for SCP-166's containment and guaranteed safety. It was the best he could do for the girl. Clef then fully defected to the SCP Foundation, where his skills were heavily in demand. Soon, SCP-166 was retrieved from the convent and brought into containment. At least now, Clef could know she was safe. The Cornwall incident resulted in the termination of the goddess, and all parties were relieved that the world was rid of this dangerous and mysterious entity. But it also brought Clef a significant amount of strife. Why did he save SCP-166? Why was the battle-hardened and brutal assassin unable to kill her? What connection did Clef share with the goddess, if any? SCP-166 often wondered about the exact details of her past. She wasn't privy to her history with Clef or all the details of her birth, or what arcane rituals she was born to carry out. SCP-166 only knew the convent, her faith in the Catholic religion, and her life in the custody of the SCP Foundation. During her talks with Chaplain Davis, she often discussed these feelings and desires to know more about herself and her past. The Foundation kept further details about the goddess and her past under restrictive classifications, and attempts to pry deeper never bore SCP-166 any fruit. One conversation between SCP-166 and Chaplain Davis was particularly noteworthy. Inside the small confessional, where the two met every other week, they exchanged greetings and began talking. SCP-166 enjoyed her talks with Chaplain Davis, which allowed her to explore her faith and further her appreciation of it. It also gave her an opportunity to talk about her feelings and thoughts in an environment similar to the ones she was raised in. To start, Davis reminded SCP-166 that information she gave him could be reported higher up in the Foundation, if need be. In the Catholic religion, confession is a confidential space, but for the SCP Foundation, the rules of the church are often broken. As usual, I have to remind you that due to our environment, the seal of confession will not take place unless specifically invoked. Even then, details of our conversation can be unsealed if they're determined to be essential. Understand? Davis said. SCP-166 understood and nodded her head. First, SCP-166 asked a question about a replacement for Pope Benedict, who announced his retirement at the time of the interview. 
Chaplain Davis responded, Ah, yes, that was rather unfortunate. But it does make sense, my child. He was rather old even when he first took up the position. Now he can rest, knowing he served the church well. SCP-166 was curious to know if a replacement had been decided. Davis informed her that while there was speculation, one had yet to be decided for certain, though he was sure the church would want to go forward with a fresh new face to broaden its mission. SCP-166 seemed pleased at this, but Chaplain Davis sensed an underlying discomfort in the girl. She wasn't speaking her true feelings. He assured her that whatever question she had, he could answer to the best of his abilities and without any judgment. SCP-166 decided to speak up. She wanted to know if Chaplain Davis had a good relationship with his parents. Davis sat back for a moment and thought carefully about his response, as he did with all questions that could cause an emotional response in SCP-166. No topic was more sensitive for SCP-166 than the matter of her heritage. Davis informed her that he maintained a good relationship with his mother before she passed away, and a less than happy relationship with his father. Davis asked SCP-166 about her parents diverting the conversation away from himself. He wasn't sure at this point exactly how much SCP-166 was told or knew. In fact, the Foundation didn't even let Chaplain Davis know the full context of SCP-166's origins. I never really knew my parents, said SCP-166. I got dropped off when I was a baby. I mean, I, I guess they must have known the sisters if they put me there, but I don't remember them, just what I picked up. They mentioned my mother a bit before they realized they should watch what they say about me. I think they said something about her being a goddess, which obviously wouldn't be true. She must have been some sort of spirit, but she must have been something if I ended up looking like this. I remember eavesdropping on the abbess. She was talking to one of the other sisters about how she had done something wrong, something about a ritual that someone else stopped. They said she died. Davis, taken aback by SCP-166's revelations, told the girl that he was sorry for her loss. SCP-166 said that it wasn't like she knew her anyway, so she wasn't bothered by it all that much. Davis asked about her father, but SCP-166 also had little information on him. She said that she had asked the abbess about him multiple times, but she never mentioned SCP-166's father. She wondered if her mother, the goddess, was so horrible. What did her father do that made him unspeakable? SCP-166's questions would not go unanswered. One day, a letter was found inside her containment area. It read, I first met your mother when we were little more than children. She had hooves for feet and starlight in her eyes. She was beauty and nature incarnate, and I killed her with my own two hands. Eden isn't a place. It is a state of being. They wanted to take us back to it, and I stopped them. I took paradise away from us for a second time. I have never regretted my actions on that day except one, and when you first met me on that day, you saw your father put a bullet into the head of your mother. I make no excuses, only explanation. You may not have even remembered it, but I'm telling you now in the hope you understand why I did what I did. I hope you forgive me. I love you. I wish I could have done more for you. The best I could do was leave you in the hands of kind and loving people and hope they would raise you in my place. From what I've seen, they did well. I'm sorry you couldn't stay with them. I'm sorry they brought you to this place. I promise to do my best to make sure your stay here is pleasant. I promise to keep you safe. Happy 16th birthday from your loving father, Dr. Clef. Site-19's director, Sophia Light, gave Clef a disciplinary interview for making unapproved contact with SCP-166 and writing such an emotional appeal to the girl. Clef had been barred from talking to SCP-166, and his superiors were even skeptical about letting him work at the same site as her. Light showed sympathy for Clef's dilemma. For 16 years, SCP-166, Clef's daughter, was unable to live her life normally because of who she was. He felt partially responsible. Despite being one of the Foundation's most trusted and powerful agents, capable of sending a strike team anywhere in the world and knowing secrets people would pay billions to know, Clef was unable to talk to his own daughter. In the end, Clef was subject to a minor disciplinary infraction, but the hope that he may one day reunite with his beloved SCP-166 remains. Now go check out SCP-407 The Song of Genesis, and SCP-6000 The Serpent, The Moose, and The Wanderer's Library for more nature-inspired SCPs.